Here is the plan. The video I've gotten the most requests for since I started my fan casting series is one fan casting the Bat Family. You know what? Let's do it. I like Batman, he's got a cool cape, and he also has a bunch of teenager friends, colloquially referred to as the Bat Family. So I'm going to fan cast those. They're not all teenagers. I know what you're thinking. Fan cast in what? The Keaton verse? The Pattinson verse? The Affleck verse? Sort of. Imagine each got their own solo movie or series. Here's how the sentence was going to continue. Like Batgirl coming up sometime in the next year or so. A movie dedicated solely to developing their character with a neutral age Batman and presumably whatever parts of the Bat family existed when they came into their own. Well, here we are in August 2022 and Batgirl is apparently canned. A totally normal thing for a functional movie studio to do. And while it seems weird to even consider a new Batgirl, it would feel weird if I left her out now since she is currently uncast. So here's the lineup we're working with in this video, which covers the pre-crisis Bat family members. Dick, Kate, Barbara, and Jason. Tim, Stephanie, Cassandra, and Damien are coming in part two. If there are some you think I missed, well, sorry, those are the big eight. Each of these videos comes with a Nebula exclusive video where I cast some less well-known but still beloved members of the family. But those eight are considered the core. Plus, I guess Alfred. And the dog. And the cow. Anyway, let's start at the top. Dick Grayson is better than Batman. I love Nightwing, one of my favorite DC characters. And that sentiment is shared by a ton of fans, whether it's his comic appearances, Burt Ward's classic take on the character, his part in the animated series, his leading role in Young Justice, and of course Teen Titans, or his various appearances in the movies that aren't that amazing, but are kind of funny. And he was in the Lego Batman movie, although they took some liberties. And then there were the animated movies, which varied. And I assume he is fine on Titans. I have not watched since season one. People said, come back, it's better, and then they killed Donna, so no, no more chances. I'm done with that show. Where was I? Oh, right. Dick Grayson is a champ. 100% comic book royalty. He made his debut in Detective Comics 38 all the way back in 1940, and he's been active pretty much ever since. You all know the story. The Flying Graysons are a family trapeze act whose circuit stops in Gotham City. And after some sabotage by a local mobster, the rope snaps, the family falls, and their only son, Richard Dick Grayson, remains. He's taken in by Bruce Wayne, who just happened to beat the circus that night. Bruce sees young Dick and cannot... Okay, listen, I'm going to say the name Dick a lot. That is this character's name. Let's all be mature. Anyway, Bruce sees this child and is reminded of his own story. Orphaned after one horrible night, feeling completely alone. So, Bruce takes Dick in as his ward. Dick lives with Bruce and Alfred and eventually learns Bruce's secret. That every night, Bruce protects the people of Gotham City as the Batman. Dick wants in. And after some back and forth, Bruce agrees to take Dick under his bat wing as the high-flying Robin. And the dynamic duo was born. Batman and Robin had countless adventures together, foiling criminals, saving Gotham... But eventually, Dick grew up and the duo grew apart. Dick founded a new team called the Teen Titans and left Bruce. And since he was no longer Bruce's sidekick, Dick took on the name Nightwing after Superman told him a story about a Kryptonian hero with the same name. And Dick has been Nightwing ever since. Okay, actually, that's not true. Dick has been mostly Nightwing. However, he did take over for Bruce on more than one occasion. Dick also took on the mantle of Talon after he learned that his family was connected to the Parliament of Owls. Dick also became a spy for a while and went by Grayson and Agent 37. He also thought his name was Rick Grayson, which, sure. So Dick wears many hats in the DC Comics universe. Let's get this out of the way. Nightwing is hot. This guy is widely regarded as the most attractive man in all of comic books. He is a stud, perfect face, in incredible shape, and, you know, he's got the best butt in comics. Like when they made the anniversary covers for Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, dicks looked like this. We comic fans have had a lot of fun over the years with the idea of Robin's perfect butt. And I'm not going to go ahead here and judge all the butts, but, you know, this one should be something special. And I mean, Nightwing is in incredible shape. He hangs out with the rest of the Teen Titans like Kid Flash and Donna Troy, and he's just a guy. But he is at peak physical condition, super acrobatic. The trapeze background certainly helps. We need an actor who is in or can get in Amazing shape. I wouldn't say he should be super bulky. I'd imagine we want someone with the body of like a gymnast. Emotionally, Nightwing is surprisingly well adjusted for a former Robin. It does seem like Bruce learned from some of his mistakes and Dick is like Bruce without most of the baggage. 
That's not to say Dick is without issues. He has the occasional daddy issues, not being good enough for Bruce, not feeling like he's earned Bruce's trust. He's gotten over that recently, but especially during his early years, this was an issue that Dick needed to work out. So our Dick needs to be able to be a little moody. And as the original Robin, Dick is also the oldest Robin, which has earned him sort of an older brother status in the Bat family like the bat Greg Brady, helping out the younger kids when they get in trouble, setting an example, going on a hot date. The bat family is really a family, and Dick is a big part of it. But Dick is his own man. He, more than nearly any other member of the bat family, has been able to fully branch out, come up with a new name, make new friends. He even moved to the neighboring Bloodhaven and started up his own crime-fighting operation. While others have been able to move on to new identities, Dick is the only one that feels like he is fully his own character and can exist independently of Batman. Like, think of it like this. Sure, Red Hood is very different from Batman, but he still fights crime with a big Batman symbol on his chest. Like, you would see that guy and go, what's his deal? Why is he? He's got guns. Who is he working for? And they go, oh, it's a, it's a Batman. That must be one of Batman's kids. Okay. And because Nightwing was also the first sidekick, when he eventually moved on, he was in an unusual position the oldest kid hero with the most time under his belt, Dick brought together a group of heroes who would go on to be known as the Teen Titans. Some were sidekicks, some were new characters, but all of them were looking for a home together and Dick was able to make one for them. Our Dick needs to be a leader. Now, after my last casting video, I wanna add a segment here where I look at each character's ethnic identity and determine how that should factor into their casting. And boy, are we starting with a fun one. As far as background is concerned, Nightwing is traditionally white by way of being half Romani. I assume when people say that they are referring to Eastern European Romani since that term can be applied to a wide range of people who are spread out all over the world. But assuming it's Eastern European Romani, that gives us somewhere to start. Now, does Dick Grayson need to be played by a Romani actor? Tough to say, because Nightwing's history with the subject has been difficult. First of all, the Romani heritage is a relatively new development considering Nightwing's comic history. Like I said, he was introduced in 1940, yet it was not until 2001 that this was officially addressed. And in that comic, they did a pretty awful job both of representing the culture and just writing in general. Look at this exchange between Nightwing and Batman. That does not sound like Batman. It's honestly pretty insane. Apparently, the more you dig into the writer and why she chose to make Nightwing Romani, the worse it gets. With all that being said, I believe the Romani element of his character is important if for nothing else than representation. Outside of Bob Hoskins, there have not really been any mainstream Romani actors, which is kind of wild because even by some estimates, there are between 10 and 14 million Romani in Europe, which is around the population of Sweden. Yet there are tons of Swedish actors you can't swing a gas pump without hitting a Skarsgård or a Kinnaman or any number of giant godlike men. So there should be more Romanis in general, and this would be a good place to start. And I do think what might be more important is that this part of Dick's story should be taken seriously, and Romani actors should certainly be cast as like his father, and the movie should address his heritage. When it comes to what age I think we will end up with, I'm casting for a man in their 20s to 30s, maybe early, early 30s. I want a Nightwing who has been with Batman, joined the Titans, and is starting off on his own. Previous versions. Oh boy. Sticking to just the movies, we've had quite a few. So Burt Ward was the original. Let's do a little guess. I have not checked this as of writing. How old was Ward when he played Robin in the show? Tap, 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 tap. Wow, he's actually 19. I had a feeling he'd be like 30, but yeah. Ward nailed the childlike wonder of being Robin. At that point in the character's history, there really wasn't much else for Ward to do. Fast forward like 30 years to the 90s. Wonder is out and earrings are in. Batman Forever's Robin was a bad boy, played by Chris O'Donnell in his early 20s. This Robin did not like Bruce Wayne telling him what to do. He wanted to party with girls, which canonically... Like, he's a virgin in this movie, since Riddler says that Robin's dark secret is he wants to one day be butt naked with the girl. So like, yeah, okay. He gets another shot in Batman and Robin and sort of plays the third wheel. He gets in the middle of Batman and Ivy's flirting. He also gets in the middle of Batgirl doing cool races. He's just sort of there. Then 2012, Joseph Gordon-Levitt is not a Robin in the traditional sense. Never gets a costume, never gets adopted by Batman, is actually named Robin. But Levitt's John Blake gets at some of the Robin core. 
He is a young, idealistic orphan who Bruce sort of takes under his wing. Blake is a cop, so not very Robin, but he's nice to kids and able to tell Bruce Wayne is Batman because he's also an orphan and has perfect orphan dar. I don't know. Honestly, I wish the movie had more time to spend with Blake and didn't end with that too cute name reveal. Just like make him Dick Grayson and have him attempt to take Batman's place while Batman is away in prison. Michael Sarah, pass. Like, okay, he's fine. He has a personality that skews closer to Burt Ward and another Robin who we'll get to in the Nebula exclusive companion video for this video, more on that later. But Sarah is clearly like doing mostly his own thing. Don't get me wrong, I love that movie. But Robin is not the most memorable part of it. You know, what else was a movie? Teen Titans Go to the Movies was a movie. And Scott Melville is that movie's Robin. And he's great. I love his Robin energy, especially at that Teen Titans stage in his life. Always trying to get out of Batman's shadows, taking everything way too seriously. And, you know, in the old Teen Titans episodes, things got real. The Red X plotline, Terra, you know, Mel Melville was good. Able to balance the cheesiness of a Robin in this cartoon show with the pain that came with betraying his friends. It, it was good. And then you get to talk about the other live action version from HBO Max, a thing that exists as of writing this video. But when it comes out, who knows? Sure, it's not a movie, but it's not TV either, it's HBO. I do not watch Titans, but man, does Brendan Thwaites have the Nightwing look down. I've heard nothing but praise for his performance from the little I've seen, I can see why. He's cool, collected, haunted by his past, very dick. My problem with the show is twofold. First, they killed Donna in a very dumb way. And two, it's just like the general tone. It always felt pretty joyless, which as a fan of the comics and the cartoon felt like a waste. And I, I get it. Season two was Judas contract, so it had to be pretty self-serious, but I wish it just wasn't so dark. Being a show for adults does not just mean saying bad language words at Batman. It's about going on dates, cracking jokes. There needs to be a balance that I don't think Titans ever really felt like they achieved. Now, would Brandon Thwaites be a good movie Nightwing? Maybe. He's a tad older than I love, currently he's 31, but he's got the look down and I do really appreciate the finer points of his Nightwing characterization. The compassion, the identity issues, from what I've seen, he has it. So he is a solid backup. Also, he deserves a suit that's good. I think the Robin suit he wears in that show is okay, but man, that Nightwing suit, while it kind of gets like the colors of it right, it's just so over-designed. It looks insane in stills. Like, just put a leotard on him. It's fine. It looks fine. I don't know. It's just like a little rant. The runner's up. I bet you notice the drawing's different and my shirt's different. It's a different day. So here's the story. I had a whole one of these all done and then I changed my mind. I shuffled a bunch of people around and added a bunch of new people. So I did a different drawing because I didn't have time. I didn't have time, I had time. But I didn't want to spend the time just doing the same drawing again. So this is the Teen Titans Go one. So here's the final, this is final, no changes, the final ones. Real quick, wanna get this out of the way. There are quite a few non-Romani actors who I think might get this role and I think it's worth naming them right here so that when I'm right, people praise me because at the end of the day, that is all I want. Rhodey is probably a scroll. So here we go. First one, never have I ever, is Darren Barnett. This guy, like man, does he have so much Nightwinginess. He's 31, which I'm not in love with, but everything else, solid Nightwing. In my mind, Michael B. Jordan should be the obvious pick for Nightwing between Creed and Black Panther. MBJ has proven that he can play an athlete with some problems. And he's handsome. Like when he took off his shirt in Black Panther, the older ladies next to me in the theater all let out an involuntary like, ooh, that's the impression Dick Grayson should make. Problem with MBJ, 35, he's sort of aged out of the role, in my opinion, which really is a bummer. He could have been great. Dylan O'Brien, don't really have strong feelings about him. He seems nice, I liked him in Curb, but he doesn't scream Nightwing, and he seems kind of upset that people keep talking about it, so I just won't. Riverdale's KJ Appa was originally cast in the Wonder Twins movie that got canned. He could absolutely do it. Jarrell Jerome is an up-and-coming star, played young Kevin in Moonlight, and won a Golden Globe for his role in When They See Us. He's very good. And am I crazy for thinking David Mazuz for this part? Like, he played Bruce Wayne on Batman, and look at him now. At 21, he's a bit younger than I'd love, but he could do it. Or what about Kelvin Harrison Jr. played Christian in the Cyrano movie, and most recently, B.B. King in Elvis. Super charming. Gavin Leatherwood. I brought him up before. I think he was one of my Johnny Storms. Well, here he is again. He's 28, but he played a college senior a year or two ago, so I think he can play younger if we need him to. Charming and aggressively handsome. Last one of these, Emily in Paris, Lucien Laviscount. 
dude is super fun on that show, very likable. I never hear anybody talk about him for this kind of superhero stuff, but I feel like we should start because I think he's great. But okay, so now that I've got this out of my system, this has been super complicated. I've put a ton of thought into it. There's just so much going on here. Nightwing is such a particular kind of character. And when you look at the other factor, being Romani, that narrows the field down a lot. But I looked, I really looked at everybody that I could find, every Romani actor on fan casting lists and just like lists and websites and message boards, like everything short of doing a casting call myself. Because I get it. This is important for representation, especially since characters like Wanda and Pietro are also Romani and clearly they didn't really go for it with them. And I imagine we'll have a similar whole thing with Doom, who I will admit, I probably should have at least brought it up. I do still really like Jamie Dornan and think he would be a good choice, but still something I should have mentioned. So I looked and looked and looked and I didn't find anyone that fit. Even just this basic stuff, like under 30, very handsome, has done something similar before, has that Nightwing charisma, and is Romani. To my knowledge, that person does not exist. Like Jesus Castro. Handsome, black hair, blue eyes, very Nightwing. But like, I don't even know if he speaks English, which is not ideal. It's not definitely a complete deal breaker, I guess. I'm casting a movie about Nightwing, who has for the character's entire history, spoken English among many other languages, but that's the big one. I'm trying to be a little realistic here. So like, Jesus Castro, Probably not quite right. And I saw other actors like Charlie Clapham, who, you know, is fine. But the thing about casting Nightwing is, unless you're looking for someone who just already looks just like Nightwing, like Brandon Thwaites, who, again, I didn't hate, but the essence of Nightwing, you can just sort of feel it. The energy, the charisma, the smile, the look. And I'm just not getting it from him. Plus, he's 31, so above what I'm looking for. Also, I'd love it if there was like one big role that I could latch on to where I could go, oh yeah, he was so good in that that he could probably do anything. But alas, none of the Romani actors I looked for worked. And yes, this is at least partially a vicious cycle of these actors not having experience so they don't get work and then they don't get experience. Yes, for sure. But that doesn't help me here. So, I expanded my search to include South Asian actors with the understanding that because the Romani people originated there, that is the next best thing. And this is not something I made up, it was something I was told by people from the community, and that left me with three guys. Dev Patel, Aaron Joga, and Aramis Knight. Don't get me wrong, I love Dev Patel, one of my absolute favorite actors. But he's 32 and he sort of feels like it. Like he feels like an older dude, less older brother, and more uncle, if that makes any sense. Also, I don't know what he currently looks like without that beard. And I don't know if he can get an incredible Nightwing-esque shape. And I don't know if he can do an American accent, which like, is that absolutely essential to Dick Grayson's character? Probably not. But all of those things together do not scream Nightwing to me. Then you've got Avin Joga. He has the opposite problem. Can do the accent, is 30, looks decent without the beard. I don't know about whether he can be in Nightwing shape either. The thing holding me back with him is I just have not seen him in anything that like wowed me. Made me go, oh, that's the guy. He is mostly known for the Disney Channel show Victorious, which I haven't seen. And most recently, he was in Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City, which I watched his parts of, and, and he's fine, but like I wasn't blown away by it. It didn't grab me. Aramis Knight probably has the most Nightwinginess going for him out of the three. He's already in incredible shape and an excellent martial artist. He looks close to the part. He's 22, which makes him pretty young compared to what I'm looking for, but Maybe not a deal breaker. My thing with Knight is that he just feels young to me. Like that might just be me, but I want my Nightwing in his mid 20s and he feels like he's a 20 year old, maybe a teenager. So those three don't work. The winner? Okay, stay with me here. So we need a super fit, charming, fun actor in let's say his mid 20s. Because of representation in the character's history, it would be ideal if we had a Romani actor However, none of the available ones quite fit the bill. However, considering the history of the Romani people, a South Asian actor is the next best thing. Unfortunately, the three that fit the criteria all didn't really work either. Green Knight, Victorious, and Red Dagger. But then I go, wait a second, there was another guy in Miss Marvel who played the hunky pretty boy who had abs, and he is 26, the age I'm looking for. So you know what? My Nightwing pick is Miss Marvel's Rish Shah. 
And you guys know, I am not the biggest fan of picking actors from other superhero things. I just feel like that's boring. Why not acknowledge talent outside of this bubble? But in this case, I'm willing to make an exception. He's charming, feels like a star on the rise. I think he could do it. I think he'd do a pretty good job. I did really enjoy him in Miss Marvel. I thought he was funny. And I do like that, like, when he shows up for the first time and he gets out of the pool, all the girls' jaws drop and they're like, whoa, that's what you want from a Dick Grayson. So, Rish Shaw is my Nightwing. Kate Kane is not trying to be Batman. Okay, so I cheated a little. Kate is going in this section even though she is not the Golden Age pre-crisis Batwoman. But Kate is sort of a spiritual successor to that character, so I am including her here. In case you are curious, back in the 1950s, people were getting ideas about Batman and Robin. Bruce Wayne was a bachelor hanging around an eight-year-old boy who did not wear pants. And even if you get past the creepy implications of that sentence, readers did start asking a question. Where were all the ladies? Is Bruce Wayne... You know, is he gay? A lot of this stemmed from reaction to a book called Seduction of the Innocent, which messed up everything by accusing comic books of being bad for kids. It led to the Comics Code Authority being created, which censored comics for decades. It was all very dumb. The book called out Batman and Robin as a gay relationship, which was obviously untrue. But every so often there would be a panel where they wake up in bed together and, you know, people start to wonder. So DC decided to nip that in the bud by introducing a love interest for Bruce, a bat woman who he could kiss, you see? And her name was Kathy Kane. She was a circus performer slash wealthy socialite who had a crush on Batman, so she dressed up like a bat woman to gain his attention. It didn't really work, but she hung around for a decade before being written out of existence. Although, she does come back when reality gets rewritten. Here is the current canon family tree. Martha Wayne, Bruce's mom used to be Martha Kane. She had four siblings, one of which was Nathan Kane, who married Catherine Webb, who became Kathy Kane. So the original Batwoman was now Bruce's aunt, and she was sort of Batwoman, and they did flirt for a while. It was weird. Then she died, I think. She was also a spy. Don't worry about it. Another brother of Martha, Jacob Kane, had a daughter named Kate. So she is Bruce's cousin. This is the Batwoman we're going to be talking about here, Kate Kane. She is the one from the Batwoman CW show, and she exists in the current continuity, fighting alongside Batman and the rest of the Bat family. Okay, now that we have that cleared up, let's talk about Kate. Kate Kane is the daughter of Colonel Jacob Kane. One day, Kate, her sister, and her mother were all kidnapped by terrorists. Classic army intelligence stuff. Jacob tried to save them and was only able to save Kate while Kate's mother and her sister died in front of her. And man, I'm not sure how this lines up with Bruce's parents' death since the timeline is pretty fluid, but that must have been a weird few years for the Kane family. Fun fact, the other Kane brother, Philip Kane, was the person who took over Wayne Industries when Bruce was away training, and when Bruce returned, Philip was killed by Joker, who was going as Red Hood at the time. So, the Kane family is not a good family to be in. Anyway, Kate was forever scarred by the murder. Very Batman. She was very intelligent and athletic, very Batman. She joined the army and learned to fight, very Batman, until she was kicked out for a homosexual relationship, very Batman? That's right, the legacy version of the character introduced to make Batman less gay was rebooted as, I believe, the first openly gay member of the Bat family, ironic. Kate is not defined by her sexuality, but it is a big part of her life. Anyway. Kate left West Point and sort of spiraled for a while. She traveled, spent a bit of time in the island of Cariana, and ended up back in Gotham. And one night, she was mugged in an alleyway. Very Batman. But Kate beat up the mugger and was about to maybe kill him when Batman arrived and stopped her. But Kate felt something, a sense of purpose. Kate always wanted to protect people, and maybe she could outside of the army. So Kate tried to fight crime on her own, and it went well until her dad found out she was using his military tech to do it. But he also got it. Kate needed this, and she could do some good. So her dad called in some military favors and set Kate up with extreme training from all kinds of experts. And after two years, Kate returned home to find a new layer, gadgets, and a costume. And unlike all the rest of these guys, Kate Kane, while a bat person, is not really as tied to Batman as the others. She does not start as a friend of Bruce's and learns a secret and then joins him. She was not trained by Batman. When she was reintroduced in the New 52, Batman doesn't even know who Batwoman is. And she doesn't really care. She doesn't reach out to Bruce. Kate is happy doing her own thing. The only reason she wears a bat symbol at all is because it has become the Gotham symbol for good guys. 
Now, that does not mean Kate never interacts with Bruce. She is part of the Bat family and they know each other's secret identities. She's just more independent than any other Bat family member. The biggest difference between Kate and Bruce is that Kate will do what she believes is necessary to accomplish her goal. She allies with killers, makes compromises, everything is not as black and white as it is with Batman. Kate also is not as tied to Gotham as Bruce is. A lot of her stories involve Kate globetrotting, tracking down the religion of crime or things like that. She is part of Gotham High Society, she goes to fancy parties, hobnobs, but I would not say she feels quite as tethered to Gotham as Bruce. After all, her traumatic event did not even take place in Gotham, it happened in Amsterdam, I think. She was not trained in Gotham, she was trained all over the world. Gotham is just where Kate Kane is from and where she makes her base of operations. Kate also, unlike about half of the Bat family, has a family. Like I said, her father designs weapons for Kate, made her suit, bankrolls her crime fighting, and is generally supportive. Until it turns out he knew Kate's sister survived the execution and has been terrorizing Kate and Gotham as Alice. When Kate finds out her father kept that information from her, she cuts him out of her life. But like she does have living family members that she interacts with. But the easiest difference to spot between Batman and Batwoman, besides the whole woman thing, is Kate Kane uses guns. Not exclusively, but she will. She doesn't try to kill with them, but her arsenal does feature a few firearms. And honestly, as long as she is not trying to kill people, I don't see a huge moral difference between a gun and a batarang thrown with incredible speed and precision. I think Kate has a point. When used non-lethally, Kate's gun is really just another tool. Like, I understand why Batman doesn't use guns, because his parents were killed by them, but like when he's telling Kate, like, you shouldn't use guns, it's like, I don't know, man. Sometimes if you could just shoot somebody in like the leg, it's fine and it's precise, and it's just like another thing in her arsenal. Why are guns used non-lethally not okay, but like smoke bombs are okay, or like throwing someone off a building is okay, as long as it doesn't kill them. Like, it just feels like a distinction without a difference, outside of the fact that Bruce's parents were killed by guns. Like, I get why he doesn't use them, just don't know why he cares about anybody else. Beyond the Bat family, Kate has a few allies, the most significant of which is Renee Montoya. They dated before Kate was Batwoman, which was not a great relationship since A, Kate was not in a great place at that time, and B, Renee was hiding her sexuality from her fellow cops, and Kate didn't love that. They work together a lot and have sort of an on-again, off-again thing going, I think. And they had a story in the new Pride comic. So I would say Renee is the closest connected character to Kate outside of her immediate family and the Bat family. But Kate is not usually tied down. And that's part of the fun of her character. She will go to a club, drink, dance, hook up with someone. She's not like Batman who's always bemoaning how he can't have fun because it's too dangerous. Kate wants to keep that balance between Kate Kane and Batwoman alive. And I respect that. I think it's fun. I like when heroes also just live normal lives on the side. And when it comes to how she fights, it's not like Kate is undisciplined and, you know, making lots of mistakes. It's she's very disciplined. She's very precise. She has a lot of reasons for what she does. She has a very interesting fighting style that Batman can't even quite pinpoint. And he knows everything. So Kate is an effective Bat person as well as just a person in the world. And I like that. One more interesting thing about Kate Kane. She is Jewish. Now, as you saw in my Nightwing bit, I do not think all characters need to be portrayed by an actor who is already pretty much exactly like them. Sometimes I believe in specific circumstances the role may require it. The more important part, in my opinion, is that these aspects of the character are actually part of the movie. Don't ignore the fact that Kate is Jewish. Have her grapple with her identity and how her religious background clashes with her superheroing. I don't know, it's worked wonders for Daredevil. Not necessarily that exact conflict, but just some kind of conflict or acknowledgement of the background. That being said, I do tend to look at actors who have similar backgrounds to those characters first, but like they're not the only ones who can possibly play them. Anyway, my final pick is pretty much perfect for both the LGBTQ aspect of Kate and the Jewish aspect, so it's not really an issue here, but I, but I do think that's worth mentioning. Also, this is not necessarily an ethnicity thing, but more of an aesthetic thing. Kate is traditionally drawn with snow white skin. Like she is more pale than any other Bat family member by far. Kate has an almost ghostly appearance that speaks to her vibe. And the pale white skin with a big red smile does sort of remind you of another Bat character. So it's interesting. She also has a bright red wig, which contrasts nice with the kind of ivory skin. So it would be cool if we could keep some of that too, for aesthetic purposes. I'm looking for someone around the same age as Batman. Assuming Batman is in his 30s, that's where my Batwoman should be too. And I'm just assuming Batman is in his 30s because that's kind of the standard age for Batman. Unless he's older. Previous versions. We've only had one Kate Kane to my knowledge. She was recast mid-show, but I'm willing to bet there's not a huge difference between the performances and 
I don't think the second Kate Kane was anything more than a cameo, although I didn't watch the third season of the show. I've only seen the first season and bits of the second. Ruby Rose's character is a fine representation of Kate Kane. It is very much a CW show, so I understand why people weren't on board immediately. It's also another show where the pitch starts with three years after Batman mysteriously vanished. I think people have had enough of those Batman without Batman shows. But just on its head, while it might not have been the perfect show, I think it did a decent job of representing Kate Kane. The runner's up. I have mentioned Kristen Stewart in previous videos, and I think she fits here too. As far as her previous characters are concerned, I wish I'd seen more high society Kristen Stewart as opposed to the down-to-earth Kristen Stewart, which I think is a very important part of Kate Kane's character, but you need that balance. You need someone who can do both. I'm sure Stewart could do it, but since I haven't seen it, she's not my favorite. We could do a fanning here. Dakota is the older one, and we could even have Elle show up as Alice, the villain who is revealed to be Kate's thought-dead twin sister. Dakota played High Vampire Society in those Twilight movies. She's been working really hard in the last few years, and she could probably pull this off. Also, I think she was pretty funny as a child in the Cat in the Hat movie, which I watched last week for my podcast, Mostly Nitpicking. It is not a good movie, but I do contend that she is very good in it. And you know how I feel about child actors. And then we've got the winner. I cannot imagine she is not the solid favorite for Kate, but still, considering everything we have said about each other, I don't think anyone fits this role better than Evan Rachel Wood. When I started casting the character, I thought, huh, Evan Rachel Wood, a super fair-skinned, bisexual, I know not the same as lesbian, but still LGBT, actor in her 30s who leads a big budget HBO Warner Brothers show. And it turns out her father's even Jewish, but she considers herself spiritual, but still, I'll take it. Forget about all the other stuff and just focus on Westworld. From season three forward, Dolores is doing everything you want Kate Kane to do. Infiltrating high society with a hidden agenda, fighting characters while wearing all black. She is calculating, dangerous, and sort of tragic. It's, it's honestly just perfect. I cannot be the first person to come up with this, but Evan Rachel Wood should 100% play Kate Kane. Barbara Gordon is ready. What do I mean by ready? Well, her origin is a good place to start. Young Barbara Gordon was on her way to a masquerade ball dressed as her favorite superhero, Batman, when she came across a crime in progress. The killer moth had kidnapped billionaire playboy Bruce Wayne, so Barbara jumped into action to save poor defenseless Bruce. When Batman arrived on the scene, he was understandably confused and asked, like, what are you doing? And she said she's on her way to a costume party, but she stopped in to help Bruce Wayne, who had mysteriously vanished. But Bruce says, okay and they go their separate ways. But Barbara loved being Batgirl. She dreamed of another opportunity to prove herself. Fixed her costume, got on a special diet, started training. She was going to be ready next time the Batgirl was needed if that would ever happen again. That night, Barbara goes to deliver a book to Bruce Wayne, but it turns out the killer moth has murdered him. As they say in the industry, it's batting time. She starts wailing on the Mothman before Batman and Robin reveal it's all part of their plan and they ground Barbara while they go chase Killer Moth. But Barbara was not going to let this chance go. She followed the boys. Lucky for her, they got trapped in some sort of tractor beam and Barbara needed to rescue them. Then she finds Killer Moth and saves the day. So Barbara Gordon joins the Bat family as Batgirl. I would say Barbara Gordon's defining character trait is her readiness. She is always down to take on a challenge. Even though she isn't always fully equipped to fight a supervillain, she's always ready to try. And she usually succeeds because Barbara Gordon is generally pretty capable. She is a super genius. I don't know if this is official, but she sure seems like the smartest non-Batman member of the Bat family. Barbara is a computer genius with the ability to hack and program. She's also able to create and use lots of new gadgets to deal with problems that Nightwing would solve with a big flip. She's got her own style. And Batgirl has a photographic memory. I don't know when this was made canon, but it comes up super handy when she's doing detective work. Barbara can re-examine an interaction to help find clues to get information no one else can. Barbara is also street smart. She was raised in Gotham by her father, police commissioner James Gordon, so Barbara understands Gotham in a way that most other Robins don't. After all, Dick was part of a traveling circus, Tim's family was rich, and Damien was raised by an assassin. Only Jason really lived like your average Gothamite before their Robin. And Barbara is very much her father's daughter. She has a strong sense of justice and respect for the GCPD, although she is ready to ignore them if they tell her to stop, yet she feels like they're not doing their job on And probably most notably, Barbara is able to adapt. In The Killing Joke, 
Barbara was shot in the stomach and paralyzed from the waist down. She was understandably pretty bummed about it and quit being a superhero. After all, she was wheelchair bound and she isn't friends with Steel, who can build her a chair that makes her walk or whatever the hell happens at the end of that movie. But eventually, Barbara realizes that she had some valuable skills that she could use to fight crime and keep people safe. She's a brilliant computer programmer with an intimate knowledge of Gotham. So Barbara Gordon became the all-time greatest guy in a chair in comics, Oracle. As Oracle, Barbara monitored crime throughout Gotham and coordinated the Bat Family as well as a new group called the Birds of Prey, consisting of herself and her good friends Black Canary and Huntress. This group expanded to include Lady Blackhawk, Hawk, Dove, Hawk Girl, Jade Canary, and even a handful of non-Bird members. Barbara quarterbacks the team from their base in the Gotham Clock Tower, and it turns out that as Oracle, Barbara is able to do things that no one has ever before. Having a leader in the field is great, but someone with a full bird's eye view of the situation is incredibly beneficial. And usually the guy in a chair is some sort of tech guru or butler or whatnot. But in this case, the position is filled by a former superhero who knows how field work is done and has fought alongside each of these teammates before. Barbara was invaluable and you could argue a far more effective hero as Oracle than Batgirl. This brings up an interesting question. Does the actress playing Batgirl need to be someone who uses a wheelchair? If we're doing a Batgirl movie, I'm going to say the answer is probably no, since so much of Barbara's story is as Batgirl. And even recently, the character has gotten surgery that allows her the use of her legs again as part of the new 52, an effort to reset some aspects of the universe to their original versions, a move that understandably upset many fans. If you're making a movie about Oracle, that's a different story and it's probably worth looking at, but the movie I'm pitching is a Batgirl origin where Barbara starts as Batgirl. I imagine down the line, maybe she would lose the use of her legs and become Oracle, but I'm gonna be casting actors for Batgirl specifically. Plus casting Oracle isn't even any fun since there already exists a pretty perfect actor for the part and Kira Allen was the right age, hair color, and also uses a wheelchair. So that's a no brainer. Honestly, Barbara is probably my favorite member of the Bat family. And besides enjoying seeing her adapt and becoming Oracle, which is pretty unique in the comics, what I love most about Barbara is her attitude. Like Dick, Barbara is pretty positive. She enjoys being Batgirl, which yeah, it's gotta be pretty fun to be a superhero. So I like that Batgirl usually shows that, and sometimes it gets her into trouble, she can have too much fun, but it's something that set her apart from Batman especially, but also much of the Bat family. One other thing, Barbara loves Dick Grayson. Outside of relationships with the occasional side character or the really awful Killing Joke movie, Barbara and Dick Grayson have been an on-again, off-again pair for a while, and I really enjoy them together, especially because Dick as Nightwing can also be written very positively. So it's kind of sweet how this nice, loving relationship made its way out of all the grim, tragic Batman stories. So I feel like the best age for Barbara Barbara is probably around wherever Dick is, so maybe a bit younger, I would say late 20s is what I'm shooting for. Previous versions. Interestingly enough, Batgirl was actually designed for the Adam West Batman show. It was planned that she would appear in the third season of the show and in the comics around the same time, which feels pretty unprecedented. She was played by Yvonne Craig and by all accounts did a great job and set the stage for a character that, for whatever reason, would thereafter always have trouble fully working on screen. Like Alicia Silverstone is the first Batgirl on the big screen in Batman and Robin, but with a lot of caveats. She was not Barbara Gordon, but Barbara Wilson. She was not related to Jim Gordon. She was instead Alfred's niece, which, sure. She also has a double life as a bad girl who steals motorcycles and does street races. Listen, I enjoy this movie, but she might be the least good part of it. Also, her uncle, who uploaded his consciousness into the bat computer, made her a suit with butt and boob plating. Very cool and normal. I do want to also acknowledge that they made a Birds of Prey show in the early 2000s that had a Batgirl played by Dina Meyer. And I watched the entire first season when it came out, and all I remember is some action montage set to a song by a band called Tattoo, during which Alfred had a machine gun. I refuse to look it up since that might not be what happened, but I love that memory. Now this Barbara Gordon was Oracle, and it seems like they put a pretty decent amount of thought into how you would portray that character. And you know, it's not bad. A Barbara Gordon also appeared on the third season of Titans, which is way past when I stopped watching. Apparently, she was the chief of GCPD and was played by Savannah Welch, an actress and musician who lost one of her legs in a car accident. So this is the first Barbara Gordon actor who also uses a wheelchair, which is certainly interesting. Since I mentioned it for Dick, Barbara Gordon also appears in the Lego Batman movie voiced by Rosario Dawson, also the new police commissioner 
seemingly much closer in age to Batman and also sort of a love interest. I love that movie, but it is doing a lot and not all of it really worked. And those are all of the big screen Batgirls that have ever been. There are no others. The runners up. I've got a lot of picks here that could work. I'm going pretty racially agnostic. She's got to be Gordon's kid, but who's Gordon? Who knows? And we'll have some redheads in the list, but if they are not redheads, we can definitely dye their hair, and that's probably fine. Barbara needs to feel like a normal girl, very intelligent, in her 20s, ready to fight crime and have some fun. First up, Hollywood redheads got to throw in Sophie Turner. I did not love her Jean Grey, but the movies did not either. I think she may be the biggest star on this list, so I would not be surprised if she gets picked. She's currently 26, which is a good age. I just really don't have strong feelings one way or the other about Sophie Turner. Next up, listen, I'm not your dad. I don't watch Bosch, but Madison Lintz has the Barbara Gordon look down. People seem to like her on Bosch. She could probably do this too. I mentioned her on other lists, but I really like Booksmart's Caitlin Dever. Solid Barbara energy in Booksmart, funny, nerd, and she's excellent in Dope Sick. Another one of these real talents who seems like they can do pretty much anything and will get snapped up into one of these franchises eventually. This one feels like cheating for two reasons. One, she's been in a show with someone who we will talk about soon, and two, she played Batgirl in the Batman Hush movie, it's Peyton List. Stars in Cobra Kai as Tori and can do karate. I would say List should be the favorite for a Batgirl movie in the future. I do also really like Zoe Dutch, who I was very close to choosing as my Rachel Summers in that video. Loved her in Zombieland too, she's fun and everybody wants some, seems very capable of playing an every woman who is also pretty smart. Also, wouldn't it be interesting to throw Lana Condor into the mix here? The best Jubilee that didn't ever get anything to do. The kids love those For All the Boys movies. I watched some of Moonshot and I think she's fine in it. I think she needs to end up in one of these superhero movies eventually and actually do superhero things. So I think she could absolutely play Batgirl. The winner. Listen, I know this won't make sense since she's only been in one other thing. But I think In the Heights is Leslie Grace has what it takes to play Barbara Gordon. Her character Nina is a girl coming home from college who had difficulty dealing with racism at Stanford and planned to quit. She's got responsibility, she's smart, and is under a lot of pressure from her father. I think Leslie Grace could be a great Batgirl. Alright, now listen. Leslie Grace will probably never actually play this character in a movie that is released. And would you even want to again if you were her? This whole ordeal has probably been incredibly stressful and a huge bummer. And regardless of the quality of the movie, we got Margot Robbie's Harley, Joel Kinnaman's Rick Flagg, Jai Courtney's Boomerang, and Viola Davis's Amanda Waller out of Suicide Squad, and there is no way this movie is worse than that. So Leslie Grace should get a chance to play Batgirl in a movie maybe about another Bat family member. Wear the suit, sell action figures, she deserves it. Most likely scenario, Maybe in a decade, they'll do a Crisis on Infinite Earths movie and she'll show up as a cameo. I could see a Nightwing movie with the little Barbara in there and I think she'd team up nicely with my Nightwing. So sure, it could be any of my picks for Barbara, but Leslie Grace deserves a shot to play her since, for tax purposes, she never has before. Jason Todd is Batman's greatest failure. Young Jason Todd was a poor kid who stole the wheels off the Batmobile, or that's what he became. I just want to clarify something. Jason was introduced in 1983 with a backstory that does not matter. But in 1985, DC Comics had its first franchise-wide reboot event called Crisis on Infinite Earths, which reset some of the characters' backstories. Jason was one of those characters. He became a poor kid who one day tried to steal the wheels off the Batmobile while it was parked in his neighborhood. Batman caught Jason in the act and followed the boy to his home, an abandoned apartment when Batman spoke to the boy, he learned that Jason was an unhoused orphan, stealing to survive. So Batman took the boy in, and in one of the all-time creepy Batman moves, immediately started calling Jason Robin. You see, Dick was off having fun with the Teen Titans, so there was an open spot on the roster. Jason seemed like the right fit, eager to fight crime, clever, and Jason trained and studied until he was ready to take on the mantle and become the second Robin. And this all went fine until Jason went looking for his mother who he just learned was alive. And when Jason found her in a warehouse, she revealed that it was all traps set by the Joker who beat Jason with a crowbar before setting off explosives and destroying the warehouse with Jason inside. He died because the fans voted he did. This was this really silly thing that they did where you would call and ask if Jason lives or Jason dies and people wanted Jason to die, I guess. Very sad. And he stayed dead for a while. In fact, they used to say that only four characters actually stay dead in comics. Gwen Stacy, Uncle Ben, Bucky Barnes, and Jason Todd. And then came 2005. 
because not only did it see the return of Bucky Barnes as the Winter Soldier, it also saw the return of Jason Todd as the Red Hood. Both sidekicks had grown up and turned into anti-heroes who did not follow their former mentor's strict code of ethics. It was a weird Armageddon Deep Impact scenario. And Jason was the Red Hood from this point forward. You see, it turns out he was resurrected using a Lazarus Pit, which is a magical hot spring that Raj al Ghul uses to heal people. And also, Superboy punched reality so Jason was all better, but evil. And this changes every time DC reboots things. Sometimes the Superboy punch brings Jason back to life, and the Lazarus Pit is just there to remind Jason who he is. Sometimes it's all Lazarus Pit. Either way, this is usually done by Talia al Ghul, who we will get to in part two of this series for reasons. Jason was then trained by either traveling the world and learning from different assassins before killing them, or going to a League of Shadows boot camp nexus thing known as the All Cast. Either way, he came back with a very specific set of skills that made him a nightmare for people like Joker. Jason returned to Gotham ready to dole out his own form of justice, killing mobsters, beating the Joker nearly to death. And this eventually got the attention of the Batman. And for a while, there was a mystery where it seemed like Jason was back, but then it was actually Clayface, but then it was Jason. It was, it was a whole thing. Batman was no kill at this point and could not let Jason execute everyone he deemed guilty. Jason, on the other hand, saw this as a way to protect people. How many people is the Joker killed because Batman refuses to do what is necessary? Like that peacemaker conversation with his dad's neighbor. So now we've gotten at what I see as Red Hood's defining character trait. He is extreme extreme methods, extreme actions, and just a general sense that this kid has gone off the deep end. Can you blame him? Hard to say. But Red Hood brings a new viewpoint to the table. Red Hood is sort of angsty, dark, takes himself very seriously, or at least he did when he came on the scene. Over time, he softened a bit, but in the beginning, it was pure 2005 edgelord stuff. So we need an actor who can be a bit melodramatic. Like, this guy definitely listened to Heaven Essence all the time. He's also got a temper. And you know how I said Dick already has daddy issues? It's something kind of every Robin goes through, but surprise, surprise, Jason went through it worse. I believe he is the only member of the Bat family, or at least the only one we're going to talk about. Actually, that's probably not true, but he's one of the members of the Bat family who have come close to killing Bruce. Certainly the only one who was an actual villain for a while. So our Jason needs to be a believable threat to Bat. Jason also does not initially work well with other Robins, no surprise. Originally, he's really hard on Tim, his replacement, and during the Battle for the Cowl storyline, he fights Dick and loses. Jason does want to be Batman and cannot stand anyone who takes his place. This is softened a bit with the New 52 and then Rebirth reboots with Jason warming up to the rest of the Bat family members. And sure, Jason is not a great Bat replacement, but Jason is not your typical comics crazy bad guy. He's pretty self-aware about how messed up his Robin experience was and how what he's doing is extreme compared to Batman. He even seems to know that he's unstable and probably would not make a great Batman. But it's that awareness that gives Jason the ability to heal and become an actually effective hero. But Jason has other friends outside of the Bat family. He forms a close relationship with Arsenal based off of their shared not great experiences as sidekicks. They team up with Starfire, who Roy is dating at the time, and become the newest incarnation of the DC super team, the Outsiders. After that team disbanded. Jason would revive it alongside the Amazon and former sidekick of Wonder Woman, Artemis, and the failed Superman clone, Bizarro. The Artemis and Jason relationship is interesting. Like with Roy, both Artemis and Jason had issues with their former mentors, and both are sort of the darker versions of those characters. Because of this similarity, the two got along well and even had something resembling a relationship. It's over now, but I do enjoy it. It's like a fun pairing between two characters frequently described as lonely and misunderstood. He's had other partners over the years, including a weird flirtation with Batgirl that never seems to go away, but I always like the Jason Artemis thing. I don't know. Jason is also tough. He has had to endure more than Dick or any other Bat family member even before his death. He lived on the streets, he's scrappy, and he'll fight dirty if he needs to. We need an actor who feels more like a normal guy than like Dick Grayson, the supermodel. And because of that life, Jason has developed a very dark sense of humor. He's not above joking and quipping throughout a battle, but his tone is definitely different from someone like Nightwing. Obviously, this is a relatively recent development, but this is something that I think they'll keep in a movie. Once Jason and Bruce reconcile, or at least when Jason stopped trying to kill Bruce, Jason became the Bat Family's troublesome older brother who is everything Dick is not. He doesn't play by the rules, he'll get you beer when you're not old enough to get it yourself, or pick you up from a party when you're too drunk. He knows all the good spots to sneak out of the house, but he's a decent guy. 
I like Jason, but he's definitely one of the Bat Family members I personally feel the least connection to. And that's not because... Oh, hold on one second. Hello? Hey, Nando. Alex from High Top Films? Hey, what's going on? Not much, man. I just sense that you said that you hate Jason Todd and you need help explaining him. Well, that's not exactly what I said, but you are the expert. What do you love about Jason Todd? Well, Jason Todd is the black sheep of the Bat family. Not just because he's always been interpreted as the edgy, angry one, but because of his upbringing. Criminal father, addict mother, Jay had it tough, man. He did not grow up with the silver spoon. He did not grow up with loving, supportive parents like Dick Grayson. He did not worship Batman like Tim Drake. Jay's childhood, his experience, his life is the exact opposite to Bruce Wayne's, which creates such an interesting dynamic if you ask me. What does this poor, forgotten, left-to-die street kid do when he is taken in by Batman, but more importantly, Bruce Wayne? There's always the complaint that Batman beats on the poor people and should use his money to help the city. Well, Jason never received any of that help. Jason is the embodiment of a random street thug Batman would not think twice about taking down. In a way, when he is Robin, when he puts on the costume and fights crime, he is fighting himself. And as Robin, as Red Hood, he has something none of the other Bat family members have. Empathy for the poor, for the abused, for the people on the street who have to break the law just to get by. That is the angle I would love to see explored, the angle that I am trying to explore. Yeah, okay, I think I get it. Thanks. Hey, before you go, do you have someone who you would cast as Jason Todd? Well, Francesco DeMaio. You can check him out in our new film, Jason, releasing sometime in 2023. Indiegogo is still up and running. This is the dream project, seriously. And thank you all for the support. Check out our latest trailer, it's pretty cool. Anyways, I've got a bolt. I just read a tweet somewhere that says Peter Parker is the next Iron Man, so I've got to go into the middle of the desert and scream. All right, take care. <laughs> Previous versions. The closest we've gotten on screen is the bloody costume in Batman v Superman. However, apparently that was Dick Grayson's costume because who cares, right? Like, that's the answer here. It doesn't, doesn't matter. None of it matters. There are two significant Jason Todds in other media. Jason Todd shows up in the first season of Titans, a show which, again, I refuse to watch. He becomes the Red Hood by the third season and does a bunch of murders, even kills one of the Titans. He's played by Curran Walters, and it's more or less what I'm looking for for a Red Hood. He felt a little small for me, but considering the circumstances, it made sense because they speed ran through his history of having him be Jason Todd and then come back as Red Hood. Like, that all happened in a very short time frame, so he didn't have time to grow up, but Otherwise, it was pretty good. Then you've got Jensen Ackles as Red Hood in the animated movie Under the Red Hood. And this is pretty much perfect. Like, more of what I'm expecting from this character. I guess I need my Red Hood to feel like an adult. Perhaps not as old as Dick, but not a child. So this version works pretty well. If you haven't seen it, I would definitely recommend it. It is on HBO Max for now. The runner's up. Taron Egerton is too old, but I do really like him for a role like this. He does angry well, and he knows how to play a streetwise kid. But yeah, it's a shame, but he's just like too old for this role. I could see Outer Banks' Rudy Pankow working really well here as Red Hood in his mid-20s. He feels like someone who's grown up and seen some stuff. I don't watch Outer Banks, but from what I've seen, JJ has an attitude, and Jason Todd definitely needs one of those. Does the name Chandler Riggs ring a bell? If not, you may know him by his other name. Cool. He's on the younger side, and I remember hearing that he quit acting, but if he's ready to get back in the saddle, he has some strong Jason Todd energy. Reservation Dogs Pharaoh Wunatai is a very close second for me. He's come up in my videos before in my Giant Size X-Men video as an option for Warpath, but as Bear Small Hill, DeFaro plays angry, rejected, and lonely so well that he would be an even better Jason. I wouldn't say Bear is quite misunderstood, since everyone on the show understands him except himself, but Bear was abandoned by his father and spends a series trying to find his place in the native community. He's dealing with an incredible loss that constantly complicates his plans. He's just like everything you want from a Jason Todd. Watch Reservation Dogs, that show rules and it's funny. I think it's sold as like a miserable drama, but at its heart, it is a dramedy with a strong emphasis on comedy. Anyway, the winner. If we want a Jason Todd who already knows how to fight, what better place to look than Versita? That's right. 
My Jason Todd is Cobra Kai's Tanner Buchanan. Why not Zolo Maraduena? Well, he's Jaime Reyes in the Blue Beetle movie for now. But his opposite on Cobra Kai, Robbie Keane, played by Tanner, has some solid Jason energy. His character becomes an accomplished martial artist, like they put in the work on that show. And Robbie also has some serious daddy issues. And Tanner plays him really well, like it's a really well written and acted show and Tanner does a great job. And while I was looking up pictures for research, I stumbled upon an interview with Cinema Blend. Tanner was asked if he'd like to play a superhero, and this is his answer. I've been a superhero fan my entire life. I'm a big comic guy, big superhero guy. Also, congratulations to Zolo. I did call him on the phone already, but congratulations to him because that's fantastic. You know, the Latinx community is getting to shine a little bit and in that world that hopefully continues. But yeah, the one I've recently wanted to play is maybe not a superhero, but a sidekick, Robin. I really want to play Robin to Robert Pattinson's Batman. I'm very specific about what I want to do with that and then maybe go on to play Nightwing. I'll go down a deep hole if I keep talking about superheroes, so I'll leave it at that. Well, Tanner, I agree. I think you'd be an excellent Robin. Just not the one you think, because Tanner Buchanan is my Red Hood. So those are my big four. And like I said, this series is organized into two parts, a pre and post crisis characters, even though, like I said, Kate was not introduced pre crisis, but her, you know, opposite verbs like the original Batwoman was, so I'm counting her. It's also kind of like part one is the adults and part two is the kids. So come back for part two, where I will be casting Tim Drake, Stephanie Brown, Cassandra Kane, and Damian Wayne. But if you want some other Bat Family casting, maybe some more obscure members, there's a video that is live right now on Nebula. That's right, I'm going to be releasing a Nebula exclusive companion video for both of these, part one and part two. The first one, the one that you can watch right now, covers the very strange bat sidekick slash nuisance bat mite, the Robin from the Dark Knight Returns series, Carrie Kelly, and of course, one of my favorite weird Batman side characters, Asriel. And if you're like, why would I care about casting bat mite? Who is even bat mite? Well, if you don't know who he is, he's very interesting. But also, I think I have a pretty strong pitch for how to introduce him into these movies, and I think you'll like it. And I'm sure you know by now, I have lots of exclusive casting videos on Nebula, one where I do the Mojoverse characters, one where I do Wolverine's extended family, and one where I do Excalibur. So you sign up for Nebula, you can watch all those too. It's probably like at least an hour of just videos that you've never seen, but they're all pretty good. Besides that, all my videos are uploaded to Nebula. Sometimes they're early, they're always ad free, and you can get a subscription to Nebula for less than $15 a year. That's not $15 a month, $15 a year. And you also get access to this video sponsor, Curiosity Stream. And Curiosity Stream has so many great documentaries. If you're like me and you're a cat person, you probably want to watch Jaguar King of the Jungle. It talks about how jaguars hunt, and it even shows a jaguar hunting a crocodile, which it was a thing I didn't even know they could do. So if you want to get access to Nebula to watch all my exclusive videos and Curiosity Stream, go to curiositystream.com slash Nando. Thank you to everybody who continues to support the channel on Patreon. Thank you to everybody who listens to my podcast, Mostly Nitpicking. Everybody who watches these videos on Nebula. And everybody who follows me on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Twitch. I'm Nando View Movies on all those platforms. That's all I got. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time.